Afternoon, everyone. I am not going to talk about high-performance computing. Okay. So dangerous when it's a room full of high-performance computing people. But I am going to talk about uh, what we've done with it and how we approach it from an industry perspective. Uh, and, give, uh, and then I think I'm going to try and turn over to q and I'm going to pause for Q&A at two stages, halfway through after an intro about oil and gas. And then, because I need to get all the oil and gas stuff out of the way. And then at the end, around insights uh, as we've approached, as I talk to my staff, infinite compute, industry, my industry, oil and gas, timeline for innovation. So think of a new idea, bring it into the field. Have a guess, what do you think? How many years? <laughs> 10? Okay. Anyone got any, anything larger than 10? 50. Thank goodness it's not that far out. It averages about 14 years, right, for us to go from new idea into the facilities. And I'll give you a perspective of why that might be the case. So let's take a look, hopefully. Uh, I'll go back to that slide. So this is where oil and gas starts from, right? The sea floor, generally. Like for those in the US onshore, yeah, we, you've got land base, we'll talk about that. For Woodside, it starts in 800 metres of water uh, with as little number of wells as we can drill because they each cost about $200 million to drill a well. And we're going to focus on one gas field called Pluto. Right. And bear with me through these movies because it gives you context to the scale of the problem. So 208 kilometres from the offshore, and this is what this infrastructure looks like. So each one of these little hats is a Christmas tree, sits on top of a well that is three kilometres, drilled three kilometres into the, and that's what it actually looks like from a ROV on the seafloor. And that well will be in operation for about 10 years without any maintenance. And we tie those wells into a central gathering system, which is what that is, to aggregate all the gas and when we export it to the shoreline where we then treat it, and we'll talk about the treating. And that's what that looks like from an ROV perspective. And that's in 800 metres of water. It's pretty cold, it's like two degrees Celsius. And then it goes through two flow lines. In case one fails, there's a backup. So for no, we don't want to do maintenance in 800 metres of water, so you build in redundancy. And that's what those flow lines look like. You know, it doesn't take long for sea life to aggregate. That's in shallow water. It doesn't get too much sea life in 800 metres. So what happens next? Right, so we've, we've aggregated the gas. Um, expensive wells, and it all comes onshore for us into an LNG facility. Liquefy natural gas. So we're going to take this gas and we're going to turn it from a gas into a liquid by reducing its temperature from in the reservoir, it's about 60 degrees, comes to the surface, cools down because of that four degree water, um, and then we bring it onto a very, very big fridge which is what that thing is in the, on the ground there. And if you were to walk around that plant, that's five kilometres. So you've had quite a bit of exercise. You've done a few steps on your Fitbit. Um, and that plant cost $12 billion. And seven years to go from idea to concept to reality. And hence why it takes us so long to innovate, because from discovery to finally getting our product to market, we've gone through a decade. And we've had to think about it ahead of time. And so that's what an LNG, liquefied natural gas train, looks like. This one's relatively new. We started it up in 2012. Um, it's got a whole bunch of sensors on it. So, so why do we turn it to a liquid? Because it's got 600 times the energy density as a liquid, as it does as a gas, 600 times. So we can then take that energy and ship it around the world as a liquid. 
Um, it's a whole lot more efficient. And so this ends up in mostly Japan powering that continent, that, con that country. So we provide, I don't know, about 10% of Japan's power. We also uh, export gas to Perth. And if we trip our plant, we have a, we have a day and a half before brownouts start to happen in Perth. So we're considered critical infrastructure for the country because of the energy that we provide to Perth um, and critical infrastructure to other nations, which has its whole, whole kind of ramification as you hear my story with cyber. As I start to digitize my operations, and so my cyber team today is eight times its size two years ago. That plant, um, 2012, have a guess how many sensors are on it? Temperature, flow, pressure. So 300,000 sensors came with the plant. I didn't need to buy any new ones. Right? I got a lot. Um, they were always designed to do a specific task. Right? What we did is that we tapped into that central feed and streamed it into Amazon and said, what can we do with it? And then I went to my data science group, which was brand new, and said, what problems can you now solve with 300,000 sensors streaming every second of every day since 2012? And we'll talk about now the innovation cycle that is transformed at Woodside given that data. Because again, they were given, when it, the plant cost $12 billion, if I increase production or utilization by 1%, $250 million of value. 1%, $250 million. We've added three to four over the course of our, since we've started that plant up, and increased its capacity. So when we built it, it was 4.3 million tons per annum, means nothing. Today, it's nearly five. So we've added a whole bunch of capacity into the plant and we've increased its efficiency on that $12 billion investment. So for me, the cost of computing and storage makes no difference. I don't care what it is. Because when I solve my problems, they make so much money to the company that we're willing to pay for what that is. And that we know that that cost is so low. So that's oil and gas. Um, what questions do you want to know? Ask anything you like about oil and gas because we've got a bit of time at the end and we can break it into, even if it's want to be, oh, it's a dirty industry, Sean, I don't want any part of it. You spoke about, you know, about the sensors yeah. and the data coming into the company in the cloud. Mm. How much data, you know, relative to the terabytes per day? Uh, I don't know because we because we end up it, it is a lot. Uh, it adds up every day. So, but we've ended up optimizing our cloud infrastructure. Anyone from Amazon here? So we've optimized our Amazon infrastructure to once we've uh, used it, right? So once it's moved, it's less value. Once it's a day old it's pretty aged and we move it on to very, very low cost. We're not likely going to need it again versus right now. Right? In 10 minutes, the data's worth a lot. After 10 hours, it's not worth very much and we shift it into very cheap storage, uh, which is almost zero. You can't use that uh, the historical Yes, so we talk about machine learning. So we'll get onto that. I'll pick that up about where, yes, we've used five years of data and we've trained the machine. Mm. I'll talk about that too. I'll pick that up. Anything generically about oil and gas? Yeah, okay. Um, so our most advanced algorithm, and we'll pick up, just to give you a snapshot, we can ask again, I'll show you later. So in the past, it's all just been in a control room, old school. Today, it's that, augmented, not replaced, augmented, and it's because of cyber that it's augmented. So the total air gap, 
between analytics apps or solutions that I'll now describe and what actually happens in the plant, a human has to make the change. So every 10 minutes the plant is optimised based on five years of learning that at it's 35 degrees currently in Karatha and the wind's blowing from the, the south at 20 knots. That impacts how efficient that fridge is. The machine knows the best you've ever done, and it might have been three years ago, on those same conditions, plus a whole other bunch of conditions it's learned about gas properties. But ignore them, think temperature. When, you're, when it's a hot day, your fridge isn't very effective. Right? So when it's a cold day, it's really effective. So we see that as more or less production. The machine suggests to the operator of the plant the best you've ever done is this, this is, and you're lower than that today, and here's four independent ways to improve your production. IoT at work. Yeah, so it's all those sensors, the machines learnt the best ever set up for the plant, given the current conditions of the day, and it suggests it to you as an operator, and it updates its memory every 10 minutes. Yep. So no, it's not just data analytics, but data analytics has shown the engineers you've got more capacity in the plant than you realise, then they've gone and investigated that, made mo other modifications to bring that capacity online. So the, the, so the theoretical was 4.3 million tonnes of LNG a year. Yeah, and we, we went, um, so what they, we, we saw in the analytics once the algorithm started running, that you would think the variability of the plant was this big and it became really narrow. But we just didn't bring the bottom up. The top drifted up as well. Why? Because the operator no longer had to think about how to optimise the plant. That had already been suggested to him or her. It narrowed the choices. And then they started to think about, well, now what? And they eked more and more capacity out of the plant. Right. Yep, so what they do though is they add up all the individual hardware limits and you end up with a conservative approach because guess what is the product that we have? Explosive. Yeah? And so, you know, I know blast protection radiuses, yeah, because of the product that we have. And so, that, as a result of me saying that, you're now thinking, you know what, don't push that plan so hard. Yeah? And that's what the engineers in design said. And so, but the data started to drive them to, you know what, you don't add all of the conservatism and add it all up. You take a system view of the world and only the system, only the data across the entire system knew that. And that's how we started to change that thinking because we had, yeah, okay, I got a turbo machinery expert who's expert in power generation, right, because we use a lot of it. And then there's an expert in chemistry about getting rid of mercury but those two domains, they don't talk to each other, but the data doesn't care. And the data does talk. Yeah. Right at the back. Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, and I keep getting asked that by my, my boss's CEO. He keeps asking me that. And the answer is you don't know what you've stopped. But I do tell you how we started, right? And so I'll move on and I'll talk about how we started on this journey. Um, that's boring for you guys. Yeah. So... How do you take a bunch of engineers who all their life been working with explosive product, siloed thinking, to stretch the limits, right? To push the boundaries. And we needed to really change that culture of innovation. And we use this word, these words, think big, prototype small, scale fast. 
And I'm sure you've all heard people say, fast to fail. Right? Hands up, who loves to fail? Right? Right? Who loves to fail two times in a row? Right? Three, you know? The answer is no one loves failing, especially when you're dealing with the product that we have. However, flipping it around to say, you know what, just take a, sh a quick prototype to your idea and it absolutely changes their thinking and they push the boundaries. It took a lot of leadership in that. I don't know, we're not really onto that topic, but that, that question when something goes wrong and there's a failure, what's the next question the boss says is a huge insight if it's whose fault is it versus what did we learn? Right. And in our industry, there was too much in the other end versus what did we learn to get the engineers, the data scientists to start pushing the boundary so that we could etch out all that capacity that was latent in the system. Prototypes more. So analytics, 300,000 sensors are now suddenly online. What are we going to do with it? We had a very rare event. It's called a foam over event. We need to strip CO2 out of the gas. So the gas doesn't come just as methane, right, which is what burns. It also has carbon dioxide in it, which doesn't burn. We've got to get that out because it's got a different uh, dew point. So we need to strip out CO2. That's done by what we call agri unit, acid gas removal unit. Acid gas is carbon dioxide. So the agri unit, essentially, that works flawlessly every day of the year normally. Once every four or five years it has what's called a foam over event. Foam over is just like it sounds. You pour your beer too quick and foam pours out. But this is in an isolated cylinder that we can't see the foam level very easily at all. Now the cylinder, the beer mug, is five stories tall and about as wide as this stage in the cylinder. So it's a big piece of kit. When that foam's over, the plant was damaged for three weeks. Um, many hundreds of millions of lost revenue. So, problem. Think big. We need to stop that from happening. When we looked at the incident report when this happened to us, one of my Senior engineer's been working in, in Woodside for 32 years. Right? Been around for a long time. Looks at the incident report. This incident goes for 10 hours. So 10 hours before the plant was upset, before foam over. Two and a half hours into the incident, Brian, the wizard of 32 years of LNG, says, well, that's what they did wrong. They should have acted there on a report. $250 million incident, he knew two and a half hours into a 10 hour event, it could have been stopped. Data scientists, enter the room. Can you look at and find what Brian knows on data only? Two weeks later, the answer is yes. Three weeks later, they can predict it two hours away. Six weeks later, three days out. They can see the disturbances in the data that predict foam over to greater than 80% accuracy. Hundreds of millions of dollars. That now is an app that runs constantly. In fact, it's so valuable, there's four different versions that use independent variables to make sure this is being watched by the machine and alerts sent, because they've got days now. And so that answers your question in a very long-winded way about uh, what have we done to protect major incidents. That's a major incident. People didn't get hurt. Hydrocarbons weren't released to the environment. But it's an example of those big system issues that affect our industry very, very rarely. But when they do, they impact a lot of people and a lot of things in the environment. And so we need to do more and more about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely, and it, it's the uh, fighter pilot thing where a lot of it's too much information that comes out of a fighter pilot, and they take a lot of it away and put it into software. We today don't automate that action like they do on a space launch, right? So they just take action and shut things down. Um, we don't at the moment, and part of it is that issue around today. We have to maintain by our regulated requirement an air gap between machines and the hardware. Um, I envisage a day that won't happen, but my goodness, you know, IoT, the biggest issue for me in IoT is the legacies. So a year ago, you could phone up my air conditioning system if you just knew the phone number and, you know, overrun it or shut it down, right? Because that's how it was installed in 1980. All you needed is a dial-up modem, which we still had last year, because right? a lot of this kit is really quite old. Some of our subsea wells that you saw, they just need to be pinged by the right frequency to take an action. That's not good from a security firewall point of view. There's no firewall in a ping. But that's the whole issue with IoT, really. It's not modern IoT devices, which have got uh, security built in from day one. It's the legacy stuff. Yeah that we, we've got throughout. And even though that was turned on in 2012, a lot of those sensors are still legacy. Just touching on sensors, mm. one's got 300,000. Mm. Did you actually identify that's a huge number of gaps? Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. So the question was, did we find gaps in sensor data? Without a doubt. Um, and we then looked at, OK, what do we do? We got to retrofit. And so I get a bill for $3 million to retrofit a sensor. I'm like, you're going to be joking me. Um, I can go down to Best Buy for those in the US or JB Hi-Fi for those in Australia um, and buy myself a Wi-Fi extender. And so part of that's the mentality of oil and gas is big ticket, big cost to big value to doesn't need to be for every part of that supply chain. And so we retrofitted Wi-Fi with wireless sensors and we used a magnet. I wanted them to use duct tape, but they used a magnet just to put the sensors in place, low power, last a year, and then we'll replace them if we still need them. Because part of the issue is, do you need them always? Because after we train the algorithms, a lot of the time, like Agro foam over event used 10,000 sensors initially Today it uses 12. So those 12 are pretty important, but you know we've got quadruple redundancy from independent variables, so even that, they're not that important. So it's back to that changing that mentality of approach to big ticket, big cost, big value to the backyarder and the garage approach to innovation. And that's the prototype small. I can't emphasize how important that is to drive that outcome. The think big is start with the problem. Foam over is a problem. How do I get extra capacity is a problem. Yeah? Uh, so I got lots of um, it, data from instruments mustn't be that big an issue compared to the data you collect from exploration. Because surely if you've got a big data area, Yep, agreed. So you're right. Sensor data is it's big from a streaming point of view, and so we end up with big trouble actually just getting it into cloud. Right? We we choke bandwidth from a remote country town pretty quick, um, and that's in this is our value chain. So we explore for oil and gas. We develop it. We operate it. We've been talking about that. Uh, and then we ship it to market. My digital group is spending all its time in the explore category and the operate category. And so in explore, we collect enormous amounts of data 
uh, in trying to get an image of the subsurface. So we are drilling four kilometres down to the targets in hundreds of metres of water, $200 million wells. You better have a pretty good idea where you're going to put that. And they get it right, one out of every three. So two are failures out of those three on a good year. So what's that image look like? Right? It looks like a CAT scan. We call it seismic. It's sound waves that are penetrating the earth. So small explosions sent through the earth, come back. They reflect, that sound wave reflects through interfaces, comes back to the earth. It's, this is a seismic boat. It's pretty big. It's a weird shape, right? Looks like a freaking triangle. I tell you, if you get seasick, don't get on one of them. Because they rock side to side like you would not believe. In fact, they kind of go like this. Right? Right? I don't get seasick, but I get land sick after I come off one of them because everything's too flat. Uh, it's that wide at the back because it tows recording instruments that are 100 metres apart, 20 of them. Do the math. That's how wide it's towing an array of sensors eight kilometres long, and there's a sample every three metres on every one of those equipment pieces. So you've got 20 streamers, recorders every three and quarter, an eighth metre, for eight kilometres. And an explosion goes off and makes a recording every 18 seconds. So that creates hundreds of terabytes of data a day. And now that data to create that image, fancy math, compute to the power of five. To the power of five. So it's frequency, so how, how much resolution you want, to the power of five. So that is a killer in compute for us. A killer. Yeah. So the question was, and we do on-boat processing. Yeah, we're used to. But you can't stick enough compute power. Actually, you can't stick enough power generation to power the compute. So yes, they do, but all they're doing is desampling the data, right? shrinking it, so that we can then take it to massive compute facilities to do the real work. And so when we create the image, it takes how long? We've got all the data, final image. Have a guess. In compute, hey? Two months. Anyone else? Throw a number. It's bigger than that. He's got six. I wish. 18 months is a bit slow. 12 months is pretty fast. So somewhere you're between 12 and 18 months from when that guy's finished shooting the data to when the geologist gets to decide, do I have anything to look at for a drill rig? Right. Half of it is compute, the other half's the human. Yeah. And the more accuracy you want, you want, n to the five, right, the more it's going to cost you in compute. So that is what is killing us from a high performance computing point of view. So what are we doing about that? Um, so we've used Pawsey for algorithm development. Uh, we mostly use Google App Cloud. We hit a constraint on data to memory before we hit compute. And it's their data center to data center transfer is the bottleneck. Brilliant. And so we've worked with both them and Amazon in order to how do we optimize to leave the data at one center so it doesn't have to transfer between centers when we distribute to cloud. So that's our biggest compute use, is at the seismic end. It's an industry-wide thing. So there's a lot of people in the industry look at that. The big majors like Exxon, they build their own supercomputers. You know, we have one. We use it for testing only, not for um, production. Yeah. So we do. We used to have a lot of on-prem, and there's 
service providers like Down Under Geo, I think are a sponsor of this conference, you know, they've got a huge supercomputer facility that we can use them as a production facility. Our issue is we need to test first, and a lot of that's done either on-prem, which we use for testing parameters, and then we go out to cloud to do bigger runs, and then that helps us inform a service provider like Down Under Geo or others. It's been absolutely optimised from economics point of view right now. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So the reduction in data coming out is like 6,000 to 1. Yeah. So we put up 6,000 times what we actually get out in terms of data. And it's, it can e that's easily under our control. The issue coming out of the machine is, is, is making sure they all finish on time. Yeah, so we're in a distributed mode, we're waiting on the last cell to finish before the image is ready, which is kind of painful. So we continue to push the bandwidth, uh, the, the boundaries of high performance computing because we want higher and higher resolution and better data when we're running against the mathematics of n to the power of five. So we keep making compromises in from 1970s to 80s to 90s that we're unwinding those compromises to improve the quality. It's a bit like a CAT scan 15 years ago when my kids, I was looking at them inside my wife's stomach. It was pretty hazy. I couldn't tell whether it was boy or girl. Today you get a 3D model of your kid in the in there, right? So that is exactly the same that we see in seismic is pretty hazy, can't really see, to, geez, that's what it looks like. So the question is, do we do stuff with methane hydrates? Um, so methane sitting really cold goes to a solid uh, and it's got a hydrate. It doesn't know is the answer. There's lots of it in the world. Right? Anywhere water depth's greater than 800 metres, you find hydrate. Um, the problem is when you put a well into it, uh, it doesn't flow. Right? So it doesn't come out of the well bore. When we turn those wells on, they run for 10 years, and there's enough pressure in those wells to make it to Sydney. No. No. Um, all right, we've got five minutes. That's okay. No good. Right, let's talk about AI. Um, so Moore's law, we've gone through, I've used this presentation, you can tell, for some other purpose, um, into the cognitive era. Now that other purpose, by the way, is school kids and my executive management team. <laughs> for them to understand what's changing Right? Because exponential growth in compute versus linear growth in human capability have crossed over. Um, and I love putting this picture up uh, because it's just, the, uh, yeah, I'm sure this room's all seen the AI play breakout and beat AlphaGo and the Watson logo. And so at Woodside, our biggest problem is 30 years of data. You know, when we build one of those facilities and we have a look back on $12 billion of investment, how many lessons learned do you think we had? 8,000 lessons. How many do you think we remember? One, the flare tower, right? Because it was the biggest mistake. You only ever remember the biggest one. Um, so 8,000, how do you bring that to life for the next generations, right? So we broke Moore's law down and its impact on us into two categories, predictive analytics for operations and AI for unstructured data, rightly or wrongly, that's the decision we made two and a half years ago. Today we have 12 AIs that are deep domain experts in unstructured data. So we focused each individual Watson or AI, they're blended now, um, on drilling, health and safety. Good examples. They speak different languages. 
And so we taught them different domains. We kept them independent. And now we're bringing it all back together with a cognitive layer that sits over the top that you can talk to and say, how is production at Pluto? And she answers you because she'll go and talk to the analytics system and bring the result back to you. What's the water depth at Pluto? She knows to go and ask the AI Watson for major projects and get that answer and return it back to you. What are the latest safety incidents at Caratha? Goes and talks to the safety AI and brings the answer back. And so we are now aggregating them through to the user. 40,000 documents with the truth fed into one system. Each document is about a foot thick. 5,000 wells. Every time we drill a well, we've got to report it to the regulator and document what we found. Each one of them is two feet thick. It's huge amount of content. We've fed all them into a Watson. So now you, what used to take three months in reading is now three minutes on interactive inquiry to get to your answer. So we're seeing as much value in bringing that augmentation to the geoscientist or the engineer through all of that knowledge that we've been sitting on that's latent in all of our document management systems or thick reports in the bottom drawer is being brought to you just by starting a, a, a query with an AI and continuing to bounce back and forth on, well, now what, now what? And we're having to train our engineers who might only have two or three years of experience who would lack confidence because they're They've not gone through all that experience, but they've now got all the knowledge of a 20-year experienced engineer. And now there's a difference between knowledge and experience in our company for the very first time. They used to just be aligned. If you were 20 years, you had 20 years experience on 20 years of knowledge. Today, you've got 20 years of knowledge on day two, because day one, you needed to get registered into our IT system, and that still takes a whole day. So that's our work in artificial intelligence. Where we are today is in deep learning, merging the two and training the system on all of that numeric data, a bit like on breakout, how do you optimize the plant? As opposed to a perfect memory, which we've already had deployed and it was relatively easy, how do you teach it? unsupervised, what should the settings of the plant be? And the moment that we've begun going down that path, we've seen during training enormous compute loads versus the application. So a deep learning on one of our unstructured data sets with Watson is takes about eight days. And then the queries in, in and out are done in less than one second. And that asymmetry is something our data science group and IT group are coming, still coming to grips with. And that whole pace of how that changes, how you guys are changing that landscape. You know, so we, my coders are in originally R and Python and now TensorFlow, you know, keeping up with that pace you know, we're very active on GitHub. These are all things we never had two and a half years ago for an industry that innovated on a cycle time of kind of 15 years. We innovate now on a cycle time more like 15 weeks and we'll deploy code in more like 15 minutes. So changes now can get up into our production system really, really quickly. Yeah, Where, who's from Silicon Valley or California? No one? Um, we can't compete with the west coast of the US uh, for talent. So two and a half years ago, we started 
building the talent in parallel to trying to recruit the talent. So out of 50 new staff jobs that created, and we've not, so when it gets to robotics and automation, um, I take a lot of pressure, like you're getting rid of jobs. I've got rid of no job. I've added 50. They're new generation jobs. Uh, we're four are recruits. The, all the rest have been brought up from within. So we started on a graduate recruitment program two and a half years ago. We continue to recruit and train graduates. Normally we rotate graduates around the business. When they join data science, they don't leave because they've got to rotate and train the next group coming through. We've also found that at 25 years of age, they're probably at the peak of their programming skills. And certainly at the peak of their mathematics skills unless we keep educating them. And that's another difference. The investment in education for these kids coming through now is completely different than when I went through and the generation before me, because it was all experience led. Now, it's like, if they're not spending something like a month on online training courses from UDX or Udacity, EDX or Udacity, then they're not spending enough time being trained on, you know, tenths of, you know, I had people come back on a two week TensorFlow workshop uh, in, at Google, you know, so sent them you know, top AI programmers there, you know, to get trained. It's an ongoing journey for them uh, to continue to be educated. So we've built from within, uh, we're sort of big enough to do that. I, I fear for those that can't, right? Um, the whole STEM pipeline in Australia is arguably broken. Um, and I spend a lot of time talking about that. This presentation is to a school community um, to try and stop that because kids are making the wrong choices at year 10 when they go into year 11 and they're steering away from advanced math because it's too hard to get a good score to enter uni, that's a stupid decision, right? And so you've got to show them what it leads to. And it gets to the point where a 10-year experienced data scientist is earning more money than our executive. Right? That is supply-demand out of balance in that, in that arena. And so we're having to cultivate from within, but it's changing your whole approach to building competency and the ongoing training requirements, which in the end they love, right? So they're loving it. Yeah, so uh, absolutely collaboration. Um, so, you know, partner with IBM up front. You know, people say, oh, it doesn't work, Sean. Yeah, it does. Yeah, there's people haven't worked out how. Um, we partner with Google and Amazon daily. Um, you can see our next partner coming here on the right. Um, and oh, one more back. And you know, we we use this brand called Future Lab. Um, academia took a lot of pressure from, in particular, Australian government around not collaborating very well with with industry. Well, I'm in industry. We do an awful job of collaborating with university because we don't give to, in uh, academia, our big themed problem areas. So two and a half years ago or three years ago, we launched Future Lab that said, here are the areas I'm interested in. And we made it really public what our problems were. And I, I have to do that because lawyers say, Sean, you can't say we have problems. What? Here's the problems we have. Okay. N to the power of five, right? That's a big problem, right? Some math genius is going to have to make that end to the power of three one day. So we push that out to academia and, and show how do you help us with that. And we do that through Future Lab. And we do it by putting spaces at the university. So we have three. We have one at Monash, themed on material science, one at Curtin, themed at the IoT, and one at UWA, themed on offshore engineering. And so we theme them quite deliberately because they get the bigger investment that lets us push problems and funds their underlying research without us getting involved with what academia is researching. So that's how we deal with academia. Um, and here's examples of 3D printing. Um, that's our, our first generation cognitive assistant. She's now just a chatbot because deploying 
Unity game engine onto 4,000 Woodside PCs was a really bad idea. <laughs> Whereas a chatbot was really easy. Uh, and of course, we've got a fairly public um, uh, collaboration with NASA and robotics that kicked off this year. Right, other questions? It's run out of time. So on Future Lab, I try not to make too much of it us dictating R&D. So a lot of the work at, say, Monash, the 3D printing, is short-term turnaround on problems. And half the investment underpins that. The other half underpins whatever the research needs to be, and we don't get involved in that. I don't know about, so in terms of my IT budget for high-performance computing, it's pretty low because I'm now buying as a service on demand. And part of that's an internal business model. If I need, the business has to pay. Um, so I have a, there's an investment philosophy around innovation. So blue sky, early idea prototype stuff, I'll corporately fund. Low end prototyping, right? Napkin business case. But you don't get very much money and you get about a week. Then you need a one page business case and I'm still funding it corporately. And you probably got a month, right? Now you're probably coming back saying, I want 50 grand and three months or 500 grand in a year. Okay, now you need, I'll fund half and the business has to fund the other half. And then we go into deployment, the business is funding everything. And so that is very directed approach to innovation and prototyping to enable pull from the business. And we have that same, and that way we, high performance computing bought on demand is easy for us to charge to our customer or business. So part of it's a business approach, not necessarily an investment. If it makes more money for us to uh, underpin a supercomputer and an investment in, in that, then we would. But it turns out it isn't, and we're best to buy it from experts because we're not that. As to the uh, uh, academia and helping them, I think my approach is go back to, well, what is the problem we would like to push out? And if you need supercomputing or high-performance computing to support that, then we're in with you and we'll help. But what's the problem that's being solved? It's always the first question at Woodside. What problem are you solving? Or are you a technology looking for a, a, a technology solution looking for a problem? We start the other way. What's the problem? Right, because people like you in this room will have the technology solution pretty quickly. Very. Correct. Correct, and hence the trough bit, the bottom of the trough is the testing. Right? of parameters, right? That's what the bottom of the trough is, and that's where we pitch in-house computing to. Yeah. Oh, so that's a, sorry, that's a very different question too, right? Because I, I have more architects, data infrastructure computing architects today than I did when we maintained our a lot of in-house stuff because it's those people, cloud architects, computing, memory, hardcore, that end, that they are the people we use to optimise our purchase. Because at the end of the day, if you draw down a 200,000 nodes from Google, you're going to see the bill, right? And so you better optimise that. And we run algorithms that are optimising our cloud compute usage for sure against all providers every minute of the day. And that's done by people who are architecting that. So we have a big investment in people in that space, for sure. And it's part of that belief in Moore's law that's going to continue, and we better be educating ourselves on the impact. 
you know I'm between you and some social drinking activity, I'm sure. <laughs> hey? <laughs> One last question then. Oh, I can wrap it up. Right here. Where does CO2 go to? Where does CO2 go to? Um, so it, today, a lot of it's vented. Uh, the, the, so it's just, it depends on the, so what they need is, what's carbon tax, right? So if there's a carbon tax, then you'll look at trying to do something else. What we do is we just offset. So we abate. So we vent in one place and we buy trees somewhere else right, to offset. The, if you, the options are very limited. So there's a lot of technology at core R&D on what can you do to crack CO2 into something else. Um, but it's very early stage. And the irony is it's super energy intensive. And so you end up in this stupid loop that you need a lot of energy to convert CO2 into a usable product. And what do you use to create the energy? Generally, you're burning that creates CO2. Unless it's, you know, so you try and think of where there's lots and lots of solar and you get the price down. So there's, there's that whole thing. The other option we've got is to inject it in, back into the ground, which $200 million per well, that's a lot of injection. You better have a, it better be worth it. So imbalance in. We generally put it back somewhere else. Yeah, but you're, we've looked at that. Um, it's the most efficient is to put it back on the edge uh, and kind of flush. If it's oil, that's easy to do. CO2 will push oil. Whereas if it's methane or other gas, CO2 um, actually doesn't push the gas. It just goes straight past it. And so you end up recycling your CO2, which is a really expensive thing to do. If only you could sell it. Sparkling water, drink more of it. <laughs> All right, with that, thank you very much.